Well, <clears throat> woke up this morning, uh, read the FT, had an article about public speaking, private fears. Uh, and it, it starts out, the comedian Jerry Seinfeld once joked about a study that suggested people's number one fear was public speaking. Go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Uh, maybe that's true. And maybe that's sort of the way I feel today because I hold you in such high regard and it means a great deal to me to uh, be here today. I want to say initially how thankful I am to uh, Janice Kuda and Joe Dinaj for doing, uh, really allaying my fears about coming here and speaking to you. And I want you to know that it's okay to ask a question at really any time in the presentation or to interrupt. I know it's your nature and there's nothing in me that wants to hold that back. I will uh, warn you that I'm not here to give you any answers. Uh, it's not the way I was raised. My father, before he died, said, uh, damn it, son, I didn't raise you to be balanced. I raised you to contribute to the balance. That there's always going to be somebody on the other side who's going to be incredibly forceful and tough, and you've got to be the opposite. So I don't come here under any illusion that I have the answers that you're seeking. But I do think I can poke you or prod you a bit, and my hope is that a month from now you're still thinking about some of the things that I have to say. Abraham Lincoln, uh, who was, of course, a great American statesman, said that if two people think the same way about anything, we don't need one of you. And I, I suspect that that's true. <laughs> now, I'm out of the music business, and of course you might wonder what I'm doing speaking at a meeting of people involved with scholarly publishing. But I will confess that uh, as the music industry has its groupies, I am one of yours. Uh, I often read Scholarly Kitchen to look for the latest in deep thinking about intellectual property, uh, and I find that fascinating. Uh, I think that music is the canary in the mine as regards uh, publishing and, I, and uh, a sustainable economy of ideas. And uh, while you might wonder why that's true, I think it's because music was unconditionally digital first that you could put a disc in a computer and transfer all of its contents by pushing a button. But books, of course, did not start out digital, and uh, movies had a great deal more digits. And so music moved very, very quickly. It might surprise you to know, and here I suppose I should duck, that the music industry funded the introduction of Mendeley. Uh, it did it. Last FM investors who took their profits put that money into Mendeley, and then there were some from the Warner Music Group where I worked uh, who continued to fund uh, Edgar Bronfman and his brother-in-law, Alex Zubiaga, at the Roan Group. And so I did spend some time understanding Mendeley and uh, also uh, giving them some deep warnings about what it was that they were up to. So I will simply say that I have paid close attention to your industry and, and I care about it very, very much. Now, typically when I give talks to people about media and its future and its past, I like to describe my topic as Tarzan economics. That we cling to this vine that keeps us off the jungle floor, the old way of doing business. And I never counsel people to let go of that vine and fight it out on the jungle floor, but I like to point out that the real goal here is to swing to the next vine and to grab that vine at some point. And last year I gave a talk called Tarzan Economics at the London Book Fair. But in reading Scholarly Kitchen, I think I was most struck over the past year by Michael Clark's intervention challenging the assumption that there was any disruption happening at all. And so I think he would say, well, we're not really swinging from vine to vine. We're still clinging to the old vine, and we may never need to let go of it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, he says your business is stable at the core, at the center, and that your main tasks remain validation, filtration, designation. The change is and will be incremental, and that dissemination and registration have long since been solved. Now, this mirrors a prediction I made about 15 years ago when I was testifying before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. I said then that digitization's effects would come to the center last, that you would not see change at the center first, that it would come first to the edge. And here my description was 
that you can really divide technology and its effects up into two different pools, what I call FCNC, or faster, cheaper, neater, cooler, and that which truly enables people to do things that they could never do before. And the digitization's effects as regards FCNC could be disregarded, but as regards enabling, that those effects would primarily be three, that those effects would be found on new art and bringing dead art back to life and enabling unusual art to find its way into the marketplace in ways that it had never previously done. In other words, my point was that you don't need to worry about getting guns and roses to the public. They'll find their way to it and they'll find each other, or Taylor Swift, or whatever modern music you are thinking of, Coldplay, R.E.M., but that we would be hearing from lots more new artists, and we would still be able to listen to lots more old artists, and still more unusual art, such as being able to buy, say, every version of All Apologies ever performed by Nirvana. And I have to say that I think I was right there, that this is precisely what is happening, that the effects are found at the fringes more than they are at the center, that this is where the enabling is happening. And history tells this story quite well, that during the time of the spread of electricity and the rise of the lateral cut disc, what we know to be vinyl, uh, vinyl phono records, that its initial effect was to bring something that was not music at all to be known as one of the most popular forms of music. So I will tell you that in the 1920s, there was an article in the Saturday Evening Post that said that jazz was not music at all, that it was merely an irritation of the nerve endings of the ear, <laughs> and that it had no place in any home and that its effects could be found in their daughters removing 30 pounds of clothing and replacing it with only two pounds of clothing, and that this was an evil to be stopped. And in fact, RCA Victor prohibited the sound recordings of jazz to be found in any way on a lateral cut disc. A small company in Indiana called Genet, G-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, sued for the right to create lateral cut discs, and a judge, a district court judge named Learned Hand, uh, issued a decision where he said, no, Genet has every right to make lateral cut discs. Their first two sound recordings were by Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong, certainly not challenging the center. And I may not need to remind you that the very first talking picture, the first picture with sound recorded on it, was The Jazz Singer by Al Jolson. So it wasn't that these new technologies were used to bring us what we were already getting. They were used to bring us something that we did not think was art at all. And so it truly was enabling in a way that was not faster, cheaper, neater, cooler, but brought us an art form we might not otherwise have. And so it is that today's talk is really to tell you that it is the fringe that will redefine your center, not the center itself. And that change will come fast, much faster than you think. Now, you might say, don't lecture us. We know very well how fast it will come. And here I need to remind you about the parable uh, of doubling, the idea that the king asks the subjects to bring him one grain of rice on the first day of the month, and throughout the month that will double, and then it will be done that month. And in the first week, you have at most brought the king 64 grains of rice. And at the end of the second week, and I think this is where your industry is right now, you have brought maybe 8,000 grains of rice. But in the third week, you are now bringing over a million grains of rice a day. And if there are 31 days in the month, you are delivering over a billion grains of rice on the last day. So change, even if you call it incremental, as it doubles, as it does very, very quickly, uh, becomes an enormous change towards the end of the month. Now, you know this to be Moore's law, I think, the notion that technology will double in power and have in price every 12 to 18 months. Peter Drucker summed it up this way. He, he said, Moore's law asserts that the price of the information revolution's basic element, the microchip, drops by 50% every 18 months. The same was true of the products whose manufacture was mechanized by the first industrial revolution. 
The price of cotton textiles fell by 90% in the 50 years spanning the start of the 18th century. The production of cotton textiles increased at least 150-fold in Britain alone during this same period. Cannons were made 10 to 20 times as fast as before, and their cost dropped by more than two-thirds. Now, I know that you know that that is what is happening in your industry, that not only is there an explosion of scholarly publishing, but its perceived value is dropping rather quickly, or at least that is how it appears to you. I think that this change comes so quickly, and eventually it is true that competition for you will not so much be with pirates as it will be with other ways to spend your time and your money. And that worse still, I don't think we'll fully understand this change until it's gone. Now, Marshall McLuhan, uh, a, a noted scholar, a Canadian scholar, something of an Anglophile, uh, who was extremely well known during his short career uh, of 12 years uh, before he had a stroke and died. Uh, he is very, very well known for saying the medium is the message. And if you didn't hear that or read it in college, he was very well known for being in the Woody Allen movie, Annie Hall. You know, he was standing in line at the movie theater behind Woody uh, while Woody was arguing with someone. And uh, Woody says, oh yeah, well, I got Marshall McLuhan right here and pulls him into the frame. And Marshall McLuhan says, you don't know a thing that I'm talking about to a New York University professor. But at any rate, McLuhan, yes, he was best known for saying the medium is the message. But he also said that you would never be able to comprehend the media of your time. And that is because media is like water to a fish. or trying to understand the air that we breathe. He said that we would only know our media through the rear view mirror of history. Specifically, he said, because of the inevitability of any environment during the period of its invention, man is only consciously aware of the environment that has preceded it. In other words, an environment becomes fully visible only when it has been superseded by a new environment. Thus, we are always one step behind in our view of the world. The late David Foster Wallace put it slightly differently. He said, there are these two fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and says, what the hell is water? And I think that's where we are with our media. I think McLuhan was right, that we don't really know what we're dealing with right now. We know what we were dealing with, and we know that we miss it, but we're not entirely sure what it is that we're in the midst of, and we won't understand that until we get further. Tech, technology, and its impact on media, media technology, I think it has a parable, and I will uh, deliver you the one that comes to me. And that is that if a media technology happens between the ages of, say, the time you are born and the time you are 13, I think it is so normal that you will pay it no attention. But if this media technology change happens between the ages of, say, 13 and 30, or if you are lucky, 40, maybe 50, that you will make it your career. It is so very interesting to you that it has come along. But if it happens after age 30 or 40, it should be illegal and banned. So wrong, is it? And so it is that I am going to deliver today some observations from my time uh, dealing with the music industry, where uh, I had the good fortune to be at Geffen and to deliver the very first full-length uh, commercial sound recording uh, that was delivered digitally to the net. Uh, I've come up with some observations, and I'm going to pass them along to you uh, so that you can think about this swinging from one vine to the other. And perhaps they will provoke you in some way, or these stories will make you think more deeply about what it is that we're dealing with. And the first observation I'm going to pass along is that progress that happens with media technology almost always happens in the name of democratization, and almost always intersects somehow with piracy. And to get started on that, I start with Johannes Gutenberg, 550 years ago or more, who we know to be the person who brought movable type or mechanical type uh, to the world. Well, not really, of course. The Chinese had been working with wooden blocks for centuries, but let's dismiss that for a moment and focus on the object of our affection, Gutenberg, because truly 
he was the most important media technologist uh, before we were alive. He made an enormous difference upon the world. He made it possible uh, for us to write about where we come from, what we think about the human condition, and to pass that information along to others. And I tell you now that my research confirms that Gutenberg was a pirate. He truly was. And worse still, Gutenberg pirated the Pope. I mean, talk about an enemy. And that was that Gutenberg noticed that the Pope was selling papal indulgences, flowing script that said that you had the right to sin and to get into heaven. Now there's a business model. And <laughs> Gutenberg, he decided, you know, I don't have to hire those scribes with their colored ink. I can merely impress uh, the paper and get that kind of papal indulgence and sell it to people. And honestly, uh, and you might think I'm making this up, but my research says it is true, that he had a venture capitalist who was funding him, which was his brother-in-law, who under great pressure from the Pope came and took the press and devoted it to printing Bibles thereafter. So Gutenberg, he truly was a pirate. And the great library at Alexandria by Ptolemy of Philadelphus, uh, amassing over 700,000 volumes uh, at its height, uh, was created by conscripting works off ships that docked in the harbor. Uh, he required that any ship that docked in the harbor had to present the originals of any books that were on board, which were copied by scribes, and only the copies were returned to those who docked. And he had a reputation for making deals around the world uh, to get books sent to him, and he agreed to pay a penalty of 15 gold talents if he did not return the book, and then he never returned any of the books. Uh, and he paid the fine of 15 gold talents in order to keep it. So he was truly uh, something of a pirate in building the very first library. Edison cylinders, piano rolls, all of them were reviled when they were created as instruments of piracy, and yet their creators said, for example, Edison said, why should you have to go to Carnegie Hall to hear the music. Now you can hear it in the comfort of your home. Uh, piano rolls were the first digital medium. Think about it. The whole is a zero. The non-existence of a whole is a one. All of the information presented only in zeros and ones. Uh, and uh, of course, John Philip Sousa, the noted band leader, said that uh, the human vocal cord would recede as had the tail of the ape uh, if these piano rolls were allowed to continue. Uh, MP3 players were banned in the first week that they were introduced. A federal judge in the United States filed an, uh, agreed to an injunction against them that was uh, dissolved then a few weeks later, and of course now we have the iPod. And it is true, I suspect you know, that every weapon introduced in human history was presented with the goal of ending war for all time. The truly weapons are presented in the name of peace. So it is that the media technology that we see is always presented in some way that is both about democratization and yet is seen as entirely piratical. The second thing I will say is that the transition from acoustic or mechanical to electric was far more savage than our transition from electric to digital. I say that because think about it. I mean, going from acoustic to electric or from mechanical to uh, digital, this seems to me to be indistinguishable from magic. I still wonder what people must have thought at the very advent of radio, the idea that human voice was literally moving through the air to be reproduced somewhere else. And during the 1920s, we got not only the spread of electricity and loudspeaker systems like the ones we're using today, but we got radio, we got television. In 1928, we transmitted a color television signal from New York to London. And surely that had to seem like it was magic, because before that time, most creators controlled their art with their feet, meaning that if they were not in the room, you could not see them or hear them. And so this was dramatic change. The 1920s make 2,000 days of dot-com fever look small and petty. And so that transition was far more difficult. 
The third observation that I want to pass along is that the future is far more actuarial than it is about actual control. It's about actuarial economics. It's not about actually controlling the quantity and destiny of content. Now, this, I think, seems elementary if you are somehow affiliated with the Copyright Clearance Center that is run by the incredible Tracy Armstrong and her team. Uh, it becomes clear that a pool of money and a fair way of splitting up can, in fact, monetize the anarchy of photocopy machines. And maybe it will tell you what kind of a odd dweeb or scholar I am that I found truly fascinating and read many times the decision in American Geophysical Union versus Texaco, uh, which eventually led uh, to the Copyright Clearance Center. It is said that after the decision was finally made, uh, the settlement before the Supreme Court, that well over 80% of librarians began taking licenses that would monetize the anarchy of these machines. But it's true that each new medium that comes along falls directly and squarely into this system. I say that because public performance of music is monetized with a pool of money and a fair way to split it up, as are all of the broadcast mediums, radio, television, now webcasting on the internet. In our industry of music, these are monetized only through pools of money and fair ways to split them up and not through control through roughly blanket, or you might call them compulsory, but they are not truly compulsory licenses, but they have the same characteristic. And they hearken back to history, to a wonderful story that comes to us from 1793 and the roughly uh, 50 years thereafter. In 1793, there was passed in France a law that you could not read books in public aloud without a license, that this would not be permitted. And in 1837, Victor Hugo and Henri de Balzac created the Society of French Writers in order to address the licensing issues that would come from having to issue so very many licenses. But it was in 1847 that Ernest Bourget, a famous composer, was sitting in the ambassador's restaurant on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, and he heard his music being played by the orchestra at the restaurant. And so he insisted on leaving without paying for his meal, pointing out that they had not paid him for the music. He was arrested and taken to court where he was told that he would, in fact, have to pay for the meal. But the judge was equally adamant that the restaurant should have to pay for the music. And so it was that Ernest Bourget and his dinner companion, Victor Perizot, formed an alliance with Victor Hugo and Henri de Balzac that led to a jeune centrale, their equivalent of your CCC. And it brought about a revolution around the world of actuarial approaches to monetizing intellectual property that have thrived and expanded to this day uh, particularly in the music industry, and of course, in many others. It's not all that different from what happened in coffee shops in London quite a while ago. They didn't know much about actuarial analysis. They were very hazy. In fact, the Queen had a business of issuing annuities that were priced without regard to age. So a 14-year-old could buy an annuity just the same as an 81-year-old. This came close to bankrupting the British government, and they eventually assigned John Grant to create mortality tables. But there was a coffee shop in London where people went to convince owners of ships to carry their goods to the new world. And the owners of these ships, much like yourselves or people in Hollywood or any other place, invariably said, no, I won't carry your goods to the new world. The price you're offering me is nowhere near enough to pay for the loss of the ship. So the answer is no, I won't carry it. And they had a habit of writing the names of the ships on the walls of the coffee shop with the names of the captain underneath and the date they'd sailed and the date they were intending to come back. And a group of bankers, they fancied this coffee shop as well. And they walked over to the owners and said, what if we took responsibility for the loss of the ship? And the owner said, well, then you'd write your name under the name of the captain. 
and thus was born the modern science of underwriting. And that coffee shop was named Lloyd's. And as a result, we have Lloyd's of London. I say to you that these things prove that while we love copyright, and I am with you on that, I call it now copy risk. Because to the extent that it is your right, there are few who will enforce it for you. We lack the technology, even more we lack the will to make this effectively a right. But when we think about it as copy risk, and we think about how every creator, every publisher runs a deep risk as they perform their work, we can redress their circumstances with compensation, even if we can't enforce the right, or if the right seems to be impractical or inefficient in its enforcement. And so we turn to actuarial models to replace that which we either lack the will or the ability to solve. The fourth observation I'm going to pass along to you, and this one troubles me the very most to pass along, and that is that we are in the midst of a transition from channel we to channel me. And this one bothers me the most. And I say that because I see the world devolving around me. From a shared fact set, to everyone having their own set of facts. I mean, in my neighborhood in Northern Virginia, it is not entirely easy to convince people that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with the fall of the Twin Towers in New York City. So convinced are they, they cite the channel they watch or the paper they read as evidence that this happened even though those involved at the time even the staunch president and vice president at the time admit that there was no such thing that was true. And so we really can't have good discussions, my neighbors and I, because we're all tuned in to channel me and not channel we. And that really is a problem, losing a community megaphone. Uh, during the war, the Vietnam War, while I was growing up, we all watched the, roughly the same TV channels and Really, it was Walter Cronkite in the United States. And no matter what we thought about the war, we believed Walter Cronkite when he said that now there were 3,072 dead. And then we would debate what to do about that. But now I live in a world with no shared community megaphone at all. And we really can't have good discussions about what we should do about things because we can't even agree about what is true. Your voices are so important to cut through that, and yet, you, like the music industry, have an infinite dial that is being stretched like a piece of taffy and then smacked into a million, billion bite-sized pieces that everybody partakes only of their part. And that really does concern me. I say that when you give people choice, they exercise it. And as we go from four channels to 400 channels to 4,000 channels to 400 to 4 million to 4 billion, we lose audience share, there's no question about it. And the numbers show that, that if you start with four channels and go to 400, the four lose a great deal of share. And that truly is a problem, because without some kind of shared fact set, we can't have value-based discussions that work for us. Now, the fifth observation, and it's going to seem a bit redundant, but I want to say that the medium actually truly is the message, that there isn't much doubt about that in my mind, that we are moving from product to service, and that as we move from product to service, it's not just that the container changes, it's that that which is within the container changes to match its new container. And this is an important observation. In the music industry, we are moving from, say, the album, of course, to the single. But increasingly, nobody even wants a single. It is about a stream of music. It is about the just-in-time arrival of customized music and not having music and downloading and holding it at all. So as something becomes more and more available, as hyper-availability becomes a part of our world, we lose any motive to have and hold that which we use at all. 
And that has dramatic implications for the nature of the art that we work with. It's good in many ways, and I say that because as we lose the motive to download, we also lose the motive to be a pirate. And in some ways, and here I am definitely going to run the risk of being very crass with all of you, but I'm going to use this analogy to get my point across. And that is that as we swing from vine to vine and from product to service, we also need to learn to be more feminine and less male. And I say that because men, and I'm one, we think much about control. We built our industries either by carrying vinyl albums in the trunk of our car or counting journals that have been printed and moved about in boxes. And in a way, we kind of get that it's a male thing to want to consummate relationships with consumers ad seriatim without so much as finding out their names. And I tell you that real value I have learned in my lifetime comes from women who have taught me that starting a relationship that never ends is far more powerful than consummating them as quickly as possible. <laughs> Amazon.com is a woman. It remembers the color of your eyes and your phone number, and it stays in regular contact with you. It has no idea that it would be good to be done with it and to move on. Whereas in the music industry, we came to covet Christmas time when people would line up at the counter, take a box, and we would shout next. That was good business. But it's not good business moving forward, and it really wasn't good business then. And having a big file of facts and keeping track of everyone and having a relationship with them, that's just about as good as it gets. And that's something that we need to cherish, to cling to, and to figure out that that next vine is a better one to hold on to than was the old one. McLuhan said it well, the medium is the message. In a culture like ours, long accustomed to splitting and dividing all things as a manner of control, it is sometimes a bit of a shock to be reminded that in operational and practical effect, the medium is the message. By stressing that the medium is the message rather than the content, I'm not suggesting the content plays no role, merely that it plays a subordinate role. David Byrne, the musician from the Talking Heads and, of course, now an independent musician, he wrote something recently. I'll read it very, very quickly. He said, I had an extremely slow dawning insight about creation. That insight is that context largely determines what is written, painted, sculpted, sung, or performed. That doesn't sound like much of an insight, but it's actually the opposite of conventional wisdom which maintains the creation emerges out of some interior emotion from an upswelling of passion or feeling, and that the creative urge will brook no accommodation, that it simply must find an outlet to be heard, read, or seen. The accepted narrative suggests that a classic composer gets a strange look in his or her eye and begins furiously scribbling a fully realized composition that couldn't exist in any other form or that the rock and roll singer is driven by desire and demons and outbursts this amazing, perfectly shaped song that had to be three minutes and 12 seconds, nothing more, nothing less. This is the romantic notion of how creative work comes to be. But I think the path of creation is almost 180 degrees from this model. I believe that we unconsciously and instinctively work to fit pre-existing formats. As he concludes, of course, we mainly hear symphonies in symphony halls. And so it is an admonishment to you that as the medium changes, so too will your work. You may not think so, but it will happen over time. My sixth and final observation is that you will need more robust registries of your content and those who create them. Because in an actuarial world, well, actually in any kind of a world, you need to have these good registries. Look, it doesn't matter your view about copyright. Let us say you are a very conservative copyright person and you believe that every you should be papered with a, signature on a, uh, with a signature on it. Well, how do you find the person from whom you would get the signature? It is extremely difficult. In my work for Nokia, I can relate to you that Nokia says that every time someone has to push a button, you lose half your audience. Imagine how much money you're leaving on the table when it's different, very difficult to find the owner of something in order to secure permission. But let us say you are more liberal. Let us say you believe in a voluntary site license or a blanket license. Or let us say you are really liberal and you believe in a government compulsory. In either of these latter two cases, you need to find the person who gets paid or we pervert the purpose of copyright. 
It is absolutely essential that we do this. Rights unenumerated are rights disrespected. And it is no surprise that the ancient Sumerians created writing for the purpose of demarking property lines. That is why they created clay tablets and reeds initially, was to replace large walls that were making the kingdom unsettling to those who would move within it. And so it is that we need to do that. The esteemed scholar and great scholarly publisher, Edmund O. Wilson, he's warned us recently that we know about, say, 10% of the life on Earth. And yet, he observes, we spend far more money looking for life on other planets. And so it is in our industry that we spend far more money looking for the next, next piece of content and great author than we do recording and enumerating the circumstances of that which we've already, already created and own. It is essential that we do this, especially at a time when creativity is being driven from the center of the network out to its fringe and its edge. So I will conclude by telling you that I am in awe of what you do and your future, that you have the friction-free Gutenberg before you and the opportunity to leave the constraints of Gutenberg behind and to move forward with purpose. It is truly the most important thing that is happening on this planet. And you might say, no, the work of our researchers is more important. They are curing cancer. They are freeing prisoners who are unjustly accused. They are doing this hard work. And I say to you, no, it is communication amongst them that is creating this progress. And that is what you enable. The issues that confront you are our generation's nuclear power. And I can only tell you that I hope you, that you realize as you do this that you can hold a great deal more in an open hand than you can a closed fist. And I thank you very much for your time, and I'm open to your questions. I'm going to get the water. I'm just steal the water while I'm uh, getting ready for this, uh, if there are any questions. Hello, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm Cynthia Wellins from Australia. Um, my question to you is, what comments do you have on discovery of content? On discovery, by who? By you or by so the by, end user or? By the end user online. So the, the issue with, with the sheer amount of, of um, material that's now available and the noise that's on the internet, What's your comments on the discoverability? I mean, are you perceiving that there's going to be eventually a real censorship where people are only exposed um, um, to information as they search um, rather than being able to actually um, surf and, f and just randomly find um, and discover? Judging from music, and if we can use that as an analogy, I will tell you that you will be shocked by what is ahead of you. And I will relate to you the problems of many of the music collecting societies today. And that is that there is an explosion of music from the fringe. You know, when I said new art, dead art, unusual art, what I meant to have said, and maybe I should have been clear about it, is that our job, your job, those of you in this room, really is to kill art every day. That's what you do. You must, like a gardener who prunes a rose bush, you have to make a tough decision. And that is, will the dissemination of this work, will the costs exceed the rewards? Because if the costs exceed the rewards, you go out of business. So you've got to be careful. And unfortunately, that means that you have to say no. And you don't mean I don't like your work, or I don't enjoy your work, or I don't think the public should have it. You mean I can't do it. I can't get there. Well, that's gone. We don't have to make those decisions anymore. If you say no, they go somewhere else and they publish it. And so in the music industry, if you pick a hit, I don't know, pick any name, Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan, and you go on to Spotify to look for it, you'll probably find 247 versions, 243 of them by people other than Bob Dylan, because they fancied playing it on the keyboard or on the tuba or a trumpet or you know, a guitar or whatever. But the fact is that it now sits side by side with the original. 
And it distracts people who are looking for the original. Some of them it delights. But those who have to collect and pay on this information see an explosion of people expecting to get paid and a great difficulty in discerning that which should be paid. And so discovery is a problem not just for the person who's looking for the music, but for those who have to pay for it on the other end. And I think you should know that on iTunes today, there are 50 million tracks. Over 10% of them are from one obscure small publisher uh, that is called TuneCore. And it doesn't have work from major artists. And so increasingly, 10, 20, 30, 40% of this enormous body of content is the stuff you're probably not looking for. And yet you have to sift through it either to find the thing you want or to pay out on the other end to make sure that the creator is rewarded. And that is so very challenging to those societies because they have more people demanding to get paid and less money to divide uh, to pay to them and very few metrics for figuring it out. I will say this, that it is essential that we build registries so that we know the difference and so that people can find the difference. And those registries critically have to be global. They have to be able to handle different languages and different character sets. And they need a globally unique identifier, a number or a character string that allows the information that's passed along with the money to find its way to the person who deserves it and such that the person who looks for that original work can find it and determine, yes, this is the authentic copy that I'm looking for. And so this we've seen is an explosion of content and a great difficulty in figuring out which content is which and who should be paid what. And if we have trouble with it, you can only imagine how the end user feels. And without recordation and enumeration, this problem is going to become many times worse for both us and for those who are in the audience. But with a great system of recordation and enumeration, one that goes beyond recording just the name of the owner, but also those who are involved. I mean, look, I believe that the translator of a work deserves a place in the registry. I believe the editors of the work deserve a place in the registry. I believe that someone who's looking for, say, a song that has a certain keyboard player or who prefers the works that were translated or edited by a particular person or a particular author should be able to easily find those things. And yet, you tell me, how does someone who now appreciates the new scholarly work by a Chinese author that is identified only as L? Liu, L-I-U, can possibly find other works by L. Liu, let alone the translator, the editor, or the publisher who was involved. So I believe it is essential that we do that. And here's the funny part. The funny part is that we think it's a cost, and we think it's a risk. But on the technology side of the industry, it's a profit center. I say that because the domain naming system that causes this problem for us, that builds the internet, that discerns every computer in this room and every other computer on the planet from one another, operates extremely profitably and with great efficiency and delivers its answer in roughly single digit milliseconds. We need to build a system just like that so that we can keep track of our stuff just the same way the net keeps track of its various computers. And we can do that by creating a market in registry services, by making it profitable to register the works. Without that, we're sunk. I can just shout. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, oh. Ken. Hi, you know. Kent Anderson, JBJS, president of Society for Scholarly Publishing and founder of the Scholarly Kitchen. Thank you for the shout out. And spoke to your group, I think, four or five years ago in the south of England. Terrific. Loved it. I think it was a different group, but thank you. <laughs> no, it was Society for Scholarly Publishing. I did not drink during the event, and I am certain okay. I recall it precisely. Well, moving on. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that goes, I think, beyond registration and dissemination is the quality aspect. I was recently at a meeting where one of the finest editorial teams in medicine was stymied by the fact that papers that had been uh, retracted, that had fed into guidelines, had fed into meta-analyses, were leading to a snowball effect of retractions and trying to trace down the source. 
Uh, when you have fraud in music, you have Milli Vanilli. You have the monkeys. When you have fraud in publishing, you have something much deeper. Can you talk a little bit about how that, with the snowball effect of change, whether those are at odds or whether those are compatible in some way? No, they're very compatible and we have the same problem. I mean, look, however you look at it down the road, you've got people who want to take credit for either something good or bad that somebody else did and to get the money that was assigned to them. Uh, an example of where I see a great danger in this area are those who believe, and I'm going to use a phrase that's somewhat ambiguous, but they believe that metadata in the strict sense of data about data can solve the problem. In other words, they believe that by embedding inside of the song or the PDF or whatever the rights information that the job is done. And yet, that information can be changed very, very easily to then redirect the money from that song or that PDF to someone else. And so we do have outright fraud, even aside from Milli Vanilli, the possibility that those around the world will assert themselves into the value chain. It requires that this recordation and enumeration happen on roughly and I say roughly because it shouldn't be one, centralized server or centralized network of servers instead of thinking that simply attaching it to the object itself will be enough. I'm not against attaching it to the object. I'm against relying upon that information. And then more to your point, the notion that there are those who fraudulently produce things, those, there are those who do those things wrong. Yes, that's going to multiply. That's going to multiply exponentially. That's going to multiply tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold into the future, which is all the more reason why you must now embark upon a regime of recordation and enumeration. It is essential. I tell you now, there would be no economy whatsoever in vehicles without VIN numbers. There would be no economy in real estate without a recordation, a Torrens lien system across the world. And yet it is that we in our industry lean on the Berne Convention and it's admonition that you need not register at all to receive all of the benefits of copyright. A disincentive to do the very thing that could solve your problem. Now, I will tell you this. I do work with WIPO, the UN's uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, where I have been schooled about Burn. Burn does not prohibit requiring registration. Burn prohibits requiring registration of non-citizens. Every country on the planet can, in fact, create a regime of registration. Brazil does require the registration of sound recordings and the assignment of a unique number. So it is not impossible for you to do this. But let's let that go. Let's not debate that, because I've only got so much time left in my life, and I don't want to devote it to reversing a treaty. Making it faster, easier, and simpler to pay and to register and to record is, in fact, the answer. There is no reason that recordation should cost a great deal of money. In fact, recordation and enumeration are a profit center. Registering a creative work of any kind is like buying a lottery ticket without having to pay out the proceeds if the ticket hits. There's no question but that this can be profitable and that it can be well done. And if I were given the choice by, between making it mandatory on the one hand to register fully a work, its owners, and all of those involved, or making it profitable to do so, I would take profitable every single time. Because I'm sure that those who see it as a profit center will engage in the kind of multilingual, diverse outreach that will enable everyone on the planet to know how to record uh, the ideas that they have and the creativity that they've been involved with. I tell you that because I watch with some reluctance, the Super Bowl, and I see GoDaddy, regist uh, GoDaddy registration advertising on the Super Bowl. So incentivized are they to extend their message across the planet. If we make it that profitable, we should have ads just like that, and that will help solve the problem that you're bringing up, which is going to grow. Sorry I'm a little long-winded with these answers, but... Uh, there's a large and ubiquitous organization whose name begins with G, and I'm, I'm Google, and yes. I'm, which may aspire to fill some of the space. No question about it. Which urgently needs to be filled, and which might fill it in a different way than we might wish it to be filled. Any thoughts about that? And maybe if you have time for a, a second barrel, what does all this mean for our biggest customer, the library? 
Well, I'll start with the first one, and I'll say this. Look, I'm not a Google hater, but I'm suspicious. But it doesn't matter whether I'm a Google hater or whether I'm suspicious or whether I embrace them fully. Uh, because, in fact, Google has come to meetings that I'm at, many of them, and said, we'll take care of it. We've got the money, and we've got the incentive. In fact, Google needs good registries to make money. Because if they can't clear content, they can't wrap ads around it. And they're leaving roughly half the money they could collect on the table for lack of registration. So they, eager, they eagerly do want to get involved and to solve this problem. And yet I caution against it. They can be one player in this infrastructure. I mean, would we turn DNS over to Google? Of course not. We would not leave it to one company to manage the network that provides information across the planet. And so it is that we should not leave to one company the recordation and enumeration of intellectual property. I think it would be a huge mistake. And when I say that, I mean absolutely no disrespect to Google at all, but simply to say that it is enough to know that people want diversity in this area, that they want choice, that they want competition, that they need competition. And the competition of ideas is, in the end result, the only way to get it done right. And that is why I argue not for someone to create the great registry. I want them to create the great wholesale registry that incentivizes retail activity at its edge. In other words, what I want is a profitable market in registry services even more than I want a great registry. So even if Google could do the best registry on the planet tomorrow with its vast resources, I would turn it down because I would say absent a market in registry services, we are leaving ourselves vulnerable in the extreme. So I'm going to, I'd love to do the second question and I'll, we'll do it out in the hall or something like that, but I've got to uh, stop monopolizing your time and just be very, very appreciative that you've had me here to speak because I truly love your industry. It's dedicated to improving the human condition and I hope I'm the beneficiary of that even more in my few years remaining. So thank you so much.